Hello, my name is John Milburn from Central Queensland University. Today I'd like to review Chapter 7 of Environmental Law in Australia by Jerry Bates. This is a very important chapter. It's part of the series of chapters which deals with the way in which environmental law is implemented in practice. Specifically, Chapter 7 deals with ecologically sustainable development. By way of history, the Brutland Report was established by the United Nations in 1983. And during that report, the Commission was charged with having to determine what is likely to be the needs of present generations without compromising the ability of future generations to also meet those needs. So the Brutland Reports um, dealt with very long-term issues. And Brutland, who was at the time the Prime Minister of uh, Norway, was asked to bring forward proposals for long-term environmental strategies for achieving sustainable development by the year 2000 and beyond that, so that international communities co could cooperate and take action to achieve that objective. Now, Briz Ms Brundland was asked to preside over this commission, which dealt with these um, really enormous issues. And at the heart of the problem were issues to do with environmental degradation. And there are two major causes. One is the dramatically increasing world population. And secondly, the powerful technology um, advances that were enabling over-exploitation of the world's resources. So this is a hugely important um, matter under consideration. While the Brutland Report came to some very good and uh, worthwhile conclusions and widely accepted general principles, the question then became how to make those principles work in reality. And in 1992, 170 governments met at Rio de Janeiro. It was the Earth Summit. And as a result of that, 27 principles were enunciated, including matters that are now effective in law uh, at a domestic level. So there are a couple of principles that, um, or a few principles that were particularly important in the context of environmental law. Principle number three was that environmental needs of the future must be considered when determining questions of environmental law now. Principle 11 was that uh, in effective environmental laws must be enacted. Principle 15 gave rise to the concept of the precautionary principle um, and principle 16 was the polluter pays principle. The status of ecological sustainable development or ecologically sustainable development is important because the High Court has made it clear that in determining legislation, unless there is a clear statement to the contrary, domestic legislation will be interpreted and, and applied in conformity with customary international law. Ecologically sustainable development in Australia has fully embraced the concept of sustainable development, both through policy initiatives and through legislation. However, for the most part, statutory requirements require ecologically sustainable development to be considered, or um, for courts or tribunals or administrators to have regard to ecologically sustainable development when making decisions. It is important that I refer you now to three sections of the Sustainable Planning Act of 2009. Section 5, which deals with what the Act proposes to advance, includes that in the decision-making process, decisions need to be accountable, coordinated, effective and efficient. Decision makers need to take into account short-term and long-term environmental effects of development. They need to apply the precautionary principle and they need to seek to provide for equity between present and future generations. Now, the reason that I'm referring you to Section 5 in the concept of 
ecologically sustainable development is this, that this whole principle of ecologically sustainable development comes as a result of the initiatives in the Brundtland Report and the Earth Summit. And some of those long-term principles, intergenerational equity and the precautionary principle, are now enshrined in our legislation. Section 8 is also important in um, the Sustainable Planning Act, and it deals with what is the meaning of ecologically sustainable development or ecological sustainability. And in that section, number eight, it refers to ecological sustainability as, of, as being a balance that integrates protection of ecological processes and ecological, sorry, economic development and thirdly, maintenance of cultural, economic, physical and social well-being of people. So when we talk about ecological sustainability, we're really, in essence, talking about making a, a decision that balances and integrates protection of ecological process and also economic development. And of course, those two concepts are directly competing with each other in a general sense. Now, you then need to look at Section 11 of the Act, which provides an explanation of the terms used in Section 8. And there are three. Firstly, econo ecological processes. B, economic development. And C, the cultural, economic, physical and social well-being of people. So in the first part, which deals with uh, the way in which uh, ecological, ec ecological processes are to be developed or protected, there is reference to biological diversity being um, necessary to be considered and uh, economic development um, is also important. Uh, there's also reference to the uh, decision making having to be made in regard to present and future generations and um, the competing interests in that regard. So that's where in our legislation in Queensland there's, there is reference to this concept of ecological sustainability. But that is essentially mirrored in um, legislation throughout Australia and also there is um, reference at a national level. So it is essentially a matter of achieving ecological sustainable development through implementation of these various principles and programs. And I've mentioned a few a couple of times, the precautionary principle, inter intergenerational equity, and conservation of biological diversity. All right, so how is that done in practice? Well, firstly, can I say this, that it's all very well to have these general terms, but ultimately, if the matter is challenged in a court context, then expert evidence is vital in determining whether a particular act or a decision does or does not meet the definition of ecologically sustainable development. One issue is whether the legislation contains a requirement that actually requires consideration of the sustainable outcome or whether it is something that simply is taken into account. So usually it will provide in the legislation that a particular decision must take into account ecological sustainability as a consideration but it is only one of a number of features to which decision makers should have regard. We mentioned that there are a few issues involved in ecological sustainable development. One is intergenerational equity. A good case referred to in Bates is Hub Action Group Incorporated against the Minister for Planning. It's from 2008 and in that case the court held that the application for a construction and operation of a waste disposal and recycle facility was rejected on appeal because the siting of the property was on prime agricultural land and the development would impede sustainability by adversely affecting the ability to use that land for sustained agricultural construct, um, for uses. So therefore, in my mind, there is one issue that comes to mind, and that is whether compensation 
should be appropriately considered in those circumstances. But that's a side issue. Now contrast the decision in Hub with that of Taralga Landscape Guardians against the Minister for Planning. It's 2007 New South Wales. And in that case, there was an application for consent for construction of wind turbines. And the court held in favour of adopting the, the principle of intergenerational equity that the overall public benefit of the development is said to outweigh any private dis disbenefits for the um, uh, people in that area. Bates goes on to say that if ecological sustainable development is to be pursued seriously, then in his view, it should be the paramount object of legislation and not simply, not simply something which should be taken into account or something that decision makers should have regard to. Bates says that when drafting the objectives of the legislation, they, the parliamentarians miss the point that ecological sustainable development is not a factor to be balanced against other considerations. It is in fact the balancing between the development and maintenance of cultural, economic, physical and social well-being as opposed to economic, as opposed to ecological. So these are all issues that must be considered in context and that is essentially that the concept is the balancing factor and not one of a number of factors that should be taken into account. The precautionary principle is another factor which is a key element of ecological sustainable development. I've already mentioned that it's referred to specifically in section 5 of our Sustainable Planning Act of 2009. So what is this precautionary principle? It is essentially that where there is a threat of serious or irreversible environmental damage, then the lack of full scientific certainty should not be used as a reason for postponing measures to prevent environmental degradation. So the principle is triggered therefore by satisfaction of two conditions. Firstly, there must be a threat of serious or irreversible environmental damage. And secondly, there must be a lack of scientific certainty as to the extent of that damage. Unless those two things are present, then the precautionary principle should not be applied or need not be applied. So in the application of this precautionary principle, decision makers should be guided by, firstly, a careful evaluation of whether there is or is not the possibility of serious or irreversible damage and whether an assessment of the risk weighted consequences of various options would mean that the principle should be adopted. Now the principle has been criticised on the basis that it's vague or fuzzy and it's not clear what is meant exactly in, in real terms um, by this principle. It's fair to say that in dealing with the principle both the scientific community and the legal community need to grapple with the question and give it some clarity in a more practical sense. So the trigger as mentioned for the application of the principle is that there is a threat of serious or irreversible environmental damage. Inevitably, therefore, science will be called upon to provide some commentary um, by way of evidence as to whether or not this precautionary principle should be triggered or dealt with. That then leads to the question of how much scientific uncertainty does there need to be as to the threat of damage before this second condition precedent to trigger the application is fulfilled. At law, in a civil action, lawyers are used to the test being 
on the balance of probabilities. That is, is it or is it not more likely than another scenario? But scientific certainty, however, requires a much higher proof, and it's generally accepted that that is a 95% confidence level. So there are different tests that might apply, depending on whether we're talking um, law or science in that regard. What we can say from the cases so far is that the precautionary principle has in some ways been used as a general reason for refusing consent or rejecting an application. But Bates quite rightly makes the point that this is often a case of decision makers acting caution, uh, in, with caution rather than with precaution, which is prescribed. All right, let's talk about the burden of proof. Who needs to prove what when, in a court context, there is the issue of the precautionary principle taken into account? At law, the burden of proving a case generally falls upon the applicant. So if the proponent of a development has received approval from a body to proceed, then anyone wishing to challenge that must prove that there is an issue worthy of consideration. The, pro the proponent, um, sorry, the objector must show that there is valid reason for a court to take into account issues to do with the precautionary principle. Now, here's where it gets interesting and a bit tricky because having properly raised that issue and brought to, to the court legitimate scientific evidence that raises the possibility of this serious or irreversible environmental harm, then it is up to the proponent to then disprove the possibility beyond reasonable doubt. So the onus changes back to the applicant for the proposal. That effectively provides for what we call a reverse onus of the normal proof from an objector to the proponent of the activity. Lawyers who practice in criminal law see this reverse onus applied in circumstances where a defence, for example, of um, um, mistake is properly raised by a defendant. Having raised that defence properly, then it is up to the prosecutor to negative that defence beyond all reasonable doubt. So unfortunately, we can't say with absolute certainty when the precautionary principle is or is not to be applied, but we do have some guidance. In Telstra Corporation against Hornsby Shire Council, 2006 New South Wales decision, Justice Preston provides a very good judicial summary of what the precautionary principle should mean in practice, and there are nine points. The first is the application of the precautionary principle is triggered by the satisfaction of two conditions precedent. We talked about that before. The first is the threat of serious or irreversible environmental damage. And the second is the lack of scientific certainty as to that damage. Once both those conditions are satisfied, then precautionary measures should be taken to avert the anticipated threat but they should be proportionate. That's the first point. Second point, it is not necessary that serious or irreversible environmental damage has actually occurred. If there is no threat or no scientific uncertainty, then the precautionary principle doesn't apply. Thirdly, if those two conditions precedent or thresholds, if you like, are satisfied, then the precautionary principle will be activated and there is this shifting of the evidentiary proof and the decision maker must assert um, that ultimately this threat of serious or irreversible environmental damage is no longer uncertain but is a reality. The burden of showing that this threat does not in fact exist or is negligible reverts to the proponent of the development.
And that's the shifting of the onus that I mentioned before. Number four, the precautionary principle permits the taking of permission, permissive measures without having to wait. And that's the whole idea of the principle. We don't have to wait until the scientific certainty. It's whether the threat has been established as real, which is important. Number five, the precautionary principle should not be used to try to avoid all risks. Number six, the type and level of precautionary measures that would be appropriate will depend on the combined effect of a degree of seriousness and the irreversibility of the threat and the degree of uncertainty. Number seven, the precautionary principle embraces the concept of proportionality. Number eight, the principle when triggered does not automatically or necessarily prohibit carrying out the development until full scientific certainty is obtained. And number nine, the principle is one of a set of principles of ecologically sustainable development. And we discussed that before, that there are a number of issues that all go to combine to create this issue of ecologically sustainable development. So I mentioned that sections 8 and 11 provide some insight as to what is meant by ecological sustainability. I mentioned that there are a number of components to ecological sustainability and they go right back to the 80s and 90s through the Brutland Report and the Earth Summit. The precautionary principle is one of them. The concept of intergenerational equity is another. The conservation of biological diversity is another, and that's a fundamental consideration. There are a number of other issues, such as the polluter pays, pays principle. All right, well, I'm coming to the end of my commentary in relation to Chapter 7, but I will say that courts and tribunals have an important part to play now in assisting relevant parties or stakeholders to understand what is meant by the general principles in a more practical sense. So courts need to consider in a practical sense what, are, what is in fact meant by these general terms and that will provide some benchmarks for future decision making. Thank you for listening.